Yeah, sounds good. All right, let me get started here. Uh, appreciate you coming out. Um, this talk, when I when I created it, it's uh, my themes kind of run along the same lines of, you know, hey, I, I show you kind of where we're at as far as an industry goes and kind of where we need to head to, but also at the same time, I break a lot of stuff and then show a lot of code too. So it's like kind of in, in between um, those types of talks. Uh, just a brief hi history of myself. Uh, I'm Dave Kennedy. I'm the founder of TrustedSec, which is a uh, information security consulting company out in Cleveland, Ohio. I also started another company called uh, Binary Defense, which does 24-7 monitoring detection, looking for attackers and uh, things like that. Um, prior to that, I was a chief security officer for, for Diebold. I ran the security program. I had about uh, 54 people or so on the team. Uh, Adrian was one of those for, for a while. And he also works at TrustedSec, as does Martin now. Martin, yay. He's aboard. Martin just came aboard last week. Um, but uh, prior to that, I've testified in front of Congress a, a few times. Uh, I've, I'm on the news quite often. I do like a lot of interviews on like CNN and Fox. I was just on uh, CNBC on Monday uh, talking about the whole FAA stuff, I guess. Um, wrote the book, Metasploit, the Penetration Tester's Guide. Uh, was co-author of, of, of that with a bunch of other folks from the Cali Linux group. And then uh, I also created the Social Engineer Toolkit, uh, Artillery, and a few other tools out there. And then um, I was a Marine deployed in Iraq. I uh, deployed to Iraq for uh, two tours. I spent about two and a half years over there and uh, did some interesting stuff. And so if you look at what our mission is in, in security and what we're trying to do, uh, you know, if you look at it, I guess, t about 10 years ago, our, our goal was to like, stop all attacks, right? We were supposed to be able to you know, stop attacks from happening because the attacks themselves were still pretty low as far as volume goes. And we could do things like you know, antivirus was at least detecting a decent amount of, of um, signatures and things like that, and the volume really wasn't out there. And so you know, 10 years ago, we were like, OK, we need to protect our companies 100%. Uh, against attackers, but that's no longer the case. The, the, the hacking industry, the hacking scene has gotten so much larger um, that it's impossible in, uh, in order for us to, to stop a lot of those. So we've had to make a lot of changes and kind of change our mindsets to say, okay, you know, our mission now isn't to protect everything in our corporations or to protect our computers or to protect our, our environments. It's really to try to minimize the damage to the company uh, in the event that we get targeted um, and also detect as it's happening. I was just doing an um, incident response for an extremely large Fortune 1000 company. And um, they got, uh, the reason why they, they ident got identified that they were compromised is that the uh, FBI knocked on their door and said, hey, you've been compromised. Um, and, and, and we're not sure how long or whatever. So we got uh, brought in to do a lot of the uh, incident response. And uh, it's not good when the domain controllers are beaconing out to command and control servers from China. Um, and it's been there for two and a half years. Uh, it's probably not a good thing, right? Um, so, you know, we got to get better at detection and looking at what, you know, is actually occurring. And these, these types of patterns that attackers use, I mean, the, the same methods that these attackers specifically use are the same techniques that I use, that Martin uses, that everybody in the pen testing industry uses. I mean, the, if you don't know, I mean, the, the threat actors are using Mimikatz, and they're using Metasploit and Meterpreter, and they have their own custom stuff. I mean, they're using, like, PlugX and a few other ones. But, I mean, it's just general run-the-mill stuff that we use on a regular basis, as do they as well. Um, so it's nothing sophisticated. It's nothing crazy or, or you know, IE zero-day related. It's, it's always the same type of stuff. They fish with some sort of you know, um, campaign, whether it's a document or a website, they compromise them and then from there they do lateral movements into the rest of the network uh, and compromise everything else. And so, you know, the, the problem we face right now is that the industry, you know, has moved towards, you know, we have to focus on this advanced actor stuff. We have to focus on this advanced persistent threats when really it's down to the basics. I mean, if, if the organization that I was working with had, you know, um, significant network segmentation, they did education awareness around their users, they had a decent monitoring detection program, the specific IP addresses that they're beaconing out to were known IP addresses for two years. So they're known bad IP addresses, you know, from command and control servers for two years. So, I mean, if you just had basic controls in place, and the artillery server that I, that I wrote had those IP addresses in there for like four years. So, I mean, it's like, you know, well, it was like two years, but um, I, I embellished there. But uh, then, you know, if you have secure coding practices, you know, uh, security integration, just the common concepts that stop a lot of these things that we see out there. Um, it'd be a much different story than, you know, trying to buy a product line to actually go and fix things. And so we see these breaches happen, and yet we're still trying to figure out what's the secret recipe um, to actually stop a lot of these attacks that are happening. And the major problem is, you know, when you see a bug like Heartbleed or um, the MS-15038, uh, um, or any of these big ones that, that come out there that happen, a company's knee-jerk reaction is to go out there and just like, okay, we need to fix this because we're going to be targeted by it. And from there, we need to go and buy something that's going to fix it. Like, uh, my favorite is, like, the, the APT prevention stuff, like FireEyes and, you know, all those great things, right? Do we know how easy it is to get around FireEye? Have we ever tried? 
don't really need to because you don't even know it's even there when you're hacking a, a customer. Like we, we, we broke into a customer, uh, it was like a month and a half ago, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, had access to everything. And they're like, hey, did you know, how did how'd you get around our fire? I'm like, I didn't even know you had it there. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, it was, I mean, it was really hard, right? Um, the APT stuff, you know, that they tout out there um, doesn't really do like a squat other than maybe giving you a little bit more visibility, which isn't a bad thing um, if you have a program out there. So you see a lot of these things happen. Um, and then you automatically get hit by APT and it's China, it's China. You know, it's, what's interesting is, is anybody, did anybody actually analyze um, the malware or the, what was published from the malware from the, the North Korean Sony breach? Yeah. Is that, is that like, did it look like it was made in like 1985? It dropped like nine different binaries, uh, really noisy, used a commercial line product to inject into to, to actually um, wipe the hard drive out. Something that literally a bunch of, you know, high school kids could have coded in the locker room, you know, over, over a weekend in order to destroy what happened to Sony. And yet that was sophisticated and it was a known actor and it was, you know, heavily targeted and all those other things, right? Like, so if you know like how to code in Bash, you're now a sophisticated actor out of China. That's what we've created in this industry. So if you know how to program, you're sophisticated, so congratulations, you're sophisticated, you, you took a C++ class, you know, C++, C++ class, and you're all of a sudden now a threat actor that can originate out of China or North Korea and destroy an entire company with horrible, horrible code. So that's where we're at. If you look at the, the main exploitation methods, um, nothing's really changed. You still see user compromises, you know, primitive exploitation and pivoting and post-exploitation. Uh, you know, user compromises, uh, what's been interesting is that uh, Java has actually um, uh, been reduced significantly over the past year or so. Uh, Java is by far the number one most attacked uh, for browser exploitation, uh, but that's changed now to, to more Adobe and most specifically uh, Flash. Um, but it doesn't mean Adobe is any better. If you look at the update cycles for Java, it has like, you know, it'll, it'll be like, hey, we fixed like 270 bugs and we also fixed like 970 security fixes, you know. So the coding still horrible um, in Java. It's just people aren't ac actively publishing um, those active exploits out there. On the user compromises, oh, it was actually interesting too. Uh, IE is finally being discontinued, so can we get a round of applause for that? Yeah. Well, so they're moving to Spartan, right? Which is the whole, you know, Halo theme or whatever. You got Cortana and Spartan now and everything. Um, and so if you look at IE exploits, uh, IE exploits were up 300% from last year. Um, so it just goes to show you, I mean, you know, even a, a company that, that has a good um, secure coding practice type, type environment like Microsoft has gotten a lot better, probably one of the most sophisticated. Um, still has significant exposures um, out there, especially when it uh, when you introduce a lot of complexity. Uh, but I mean, you know, the two main exploitation exploitation methods that we typically see, uh, you know, user gets fished, sends an email, compromises them, and it's usually through a malicious website. And those are usually the easiest because you can coax and make things, um, you know, pretty believable when it comes to a website, and especially if you make it somewhat believable in some way, shape, or form. Uh, someone's going to click a link and compromise. The attachments are still out there, but uh, much less uh, prominent. You know. It, you know, if you look five or six years ago, you had the, you know, zip files with an EXE inside of it, and people weren't filtering on that, and so someone would open up a zip file and then open up an EXE, and then they would get compromised, right? Um, now it's more so on, like, document or file format bugs, um, so, like, you know, Adobe things, uh, you know, uh, Office uh, product lines, but those are still uh, less common. Uh, primitive exploitation, a lot less common as well. I mean, when you can go in and fish individuals, it's a lot easier um, to, to target an individual than it is to try to hack and find SQL injection and then from there compromise. Uh, but a lot of cases, um, the CMSs are being hacked, like WordPress, for example, or Joomla. It's mostly on the, the vulnerable plugin extensions um, that a lot of those sites have. They'll add a, an extension that has a vulnerability on it, ends up getting compromised, and the website, uh, the web server itself beco becomes compromised. And then the pivoting and post exploitation. Again, I mean, to, to obfuscate something or to encrypt it or to make a payload. Um, not get picked up by endpoint protection is, is extremely trivial. Um, and so if you look at like Symantec endpoint protection or McAfee or Sophos or all of the different, you know, antivirus vendors that you see out there, they're all extremely trivial uh, to get around. And you can buy a program online for 30 bucks or you can even just find the free ones that are online that crypt them for you. There's one out there called Hyperion, um, which is a really great one. It's, it's uh, if you haven't seen it before, it, uh, it takes your executable and it encrypts it in an AES uh, container, okay? So the, 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 your, your, all of your shell code is encrypted in memory, right, in an AES container. And so in order to get access to that, it has to um, brute force a key. So it actually brute forces itself, and it uses a weak AES key, and then brute forces itself until it finds that key, and then it decrypts itself in memory. So it's a unique one every single time. It's kind of an interesting concept. Um, really big fan of that. It's an open source one. The new version just came out, does a lot more um, obfuscation techniques. Um, but really, those are, are easy to get. And then pivoting and post-exploitation, you know, compromising a site, and from there going into one, hacking into the rest, um, you know, kind of a, a trivial uh, challenge. And so, you know, we have the same problem. Um, 
the industry focuses on technology versus what's really a people problem. It focuses on expanding the security program and making it larger and getting more people and you know, getting more technology to support those people um, and being able to, to try to get to a program to where you can identify threats uh, faster. The problem is that security for me isn't a um, technical problem, it's a social one. And if you have ever seen, um, what was it, Ancient Aliens before, right? You know, I, I watched the show for the first time, like, and, and I always saw the memes come out with this, this guy, you know, it's like aliens or whatever. Um, but I think he was explaining how, like, Franklin Delver Roosevelt had, you know, architected this triangle in downtown Washington, you know, D.C., that, that could be a sign for aliens when we come in that we're the focal point in the United States, the focal point to come to. And I lost all respect, so I put them in every one of my PowerPoints. Um, but uh, security is, is something that, to me, is, is more of a communication issue uh, than it is a technology one. I mean, we obviously need technology to, to prevent technology, but in most cases, a security program inside of a corporation isn't structured uh, to handle what we see out there. I mean, you look at any type of uh, chief security officer, in most cases, they're, they're dealing with business things, and then you have the team that's kind of underneath them, and then they're fighting fires every single day, and they're not structured in a way uh, to really be successful because the company doesn't understand what they do or what they're trying to do. Um, in most companies that you see a successful program, they have a very good presence um, for all their people. And so for me, we need less people focused on, on you know, doing specific technology things or uh, less solutions. We need an industry that isn't focused on products. And um, what's interesting is uh, there's a big conference going on right now called RSA, right? I haven't gone to R I went to RSA once, and I'll never go again. I walked into the vendor area, and I literally got sick to my stomach uh, because of what they're doing. I mean, they have, you know, booth babes and, you know, people with, like, cash and these little things, you know, trying to grab cash and stuff like that. And it was, like, it was just a complete show of of trying to coax you into going to their, their booth so that you can buy their products. And that's exactly what this industry has turned into, which is a, a pretty scary one. I mean, granted, I mean, I'm sure some of the technology is really great, but it's usually put into place before a program actually um, gets established. And it's just, for me, it was, it was, I literally got physically sick to my stomach and had to walk out of there, and I'll never go to RSA ever again. And so if, you, uh, if you're familiar with the purple team, I, I, I've said this concept a couple of times. Um, but it's a combination of the red team and blue team. Uh, it's working together. And I'm a huge fan of it because um, is anybody here on the defense like, protecting? Anybody here on the offense? Is anybody here not in security at all? Just curious. Okay, that, that too. Could be. I, do, I, I have that effect. So, <laughs> so if you have... If you have people on the defense and people on the offense, um, coming together to understand uh, one another is a really important part. And uh, when you talk about the purple team, it's a concept I've talked about a lot of, um, but it's something that, that I've been focusing on, especially a lot of the last years. And I'm going to show you a couple examples of that. So lately, um, we've been having a lot of fun. Like, you know, we, we'll go into an assessment and we'll break in. Um, and, uh, you know, after that, we try to build something or, or write a new tutorial or do something. Like, uh, I'll show you one here in just a second where I was doing a pen test uh, yesterday. And um, you, we had compromised uh, the external website through SQL injection, okay? Got access to the underlying operating system, but we were running as a very limited uh, user account. So we had basically running as network service, which is a very limited user account in the operating system. And so we, we couldn't do any type of privilege escalation. We've been trying for probably three or four days. Martin was working on it too, but... Um, we've been working. We've all been working on trying to trying to get get, get privilege escalation on this machine because you know you compromise a machine in DMZ. The hope is that you can leverage that to piggyback and and do pivoting or lateral movements into the environment. So what I ended up figuring out is that um, the the domains were on two separate domains. So you had a you had a, a domain that basically was was inside their DMZ, and then you had another domain which was kind of their corporate you know infrastructure right domain. So two separate D, uh, DMZs, very good infrastructure. Uh, they had a one way trust between the two. So the um, internal um, domain trusted the DMZ domain, okay? Um, so what I was able to do from there is I, uh, uh, there's a uh, technique called RID cycling that allows you to enumerate users. And if the one domain I'm going after and I query the other domain, if it has a trust established, I can query those users and cycle through and dump a whole list of user uh, accounts on that domain, the inside corporate domain, right? So I can dump all of the, those users from the inside, and then from there I brute force all the user accounts. Brute force all the user accounts. Of course, I find one that's like summer 2015, another one of password one, you know, um, those type of things. So I find two or three uh, legitimate user accounts. So once I find three user accounts, um, I then logged in through OW, OWA. Um, so they had an OWA server um, uh, on the outside. Logged in, and I sent an email from this individual to a couple people in his team. And I actually sp spent all of last night. I was up last night until probably you know, 11, 12 o'clock going through individual emails to find the perfect one. You know, when you find that perfect email, you're like, 
that's the one. You know, that's the one that's going to get me in because they already have a communication established. They've already talked about it. And so, it was, you know, it was a person in IT that we ended up compromising, and they were talking about, you know, changes for the environment and, you know, going through some process or whatever. And so I said, you know, hey, you know, can you, can you check out this? And they had, they had extent, uh, sent an uh, uh, Excel spreadsheet. So I responded back and said, hey, I updated the Excel spreadsheet. Just want to make sure everything's good. Now, there's a technique that just, if you just notice, I, I released a new version of uh, Unicorn. If you're not familiar with Unicorn, I'll, I'll explain that in a second. Um, but Unicorn is a, a, a PowerShell injection tool. If you didn't notice, yesterday I did a big update to it. Because when I do a pen test and I come up with something cool, I usually write you know, cool code into it, and then I update the code, and then I publish it out to the rest of the world. Um, so what I did with Unicorn, um, and if you're not familiar with that, I'll skip ahead here and I'll actually show you. So Unicorn, um, if you're not familiar, PowerShell is like amazing, right? It's the coolest thing that's ever happened to both the defensive side as well as completely the offensive side as well. So if I have the ability um, to do anything, when I, call, when I say anything, like uh, if I have the ability to do any type of what we call remote command injection or remote code execution, PowerShell is by far my go-to, like, number one. Like, I don't drop binaries on computers anymore. I don't install malware or anything like that. I just use PowerShell completely. I don't even touch, you know, you know generating binaries anymore because PowerShell is like, the most effective. And so this technique, um, and this, you can get this from our GitHub site. It's uh, tr uh, github.com slash trustedsec slash github. I use this on almost every single pen test that I do because it's so effective. And what this does is if, if PowerShell is installed, which by default it's going to be installed on anything Windows Vista and above, and anything um, Server 2003, Service Pack 2 and above, I believe, um, but definitely 2008 and 2012. And so with PowerShell, what you can do is that you can um, basically call the .NET assemblies. Um, you know, you have a full-fledged programming language at your fingertips. And what you can do with this one is there's an individual named Matthew Graber that came out with the concept of, of being able to do um, uh, native shellcode injection inside of a PowerShell. So Metasploit shellcode or any shellcode that you have, assembly code, you can inject it directly into memory. And so I took that and I rewrote it to where um, it does what's called an x86 downgrade attack where it's compatible with 64-bit and 32-bit. I'm not going to go into all the details because I'll lose everybody. Um, but once, I, once, it, once you run this command, um, it executes it. And uh, uh, it gives you a command, a, a text file that you can basically uh, copy and paste into anywhere that you have a command prompt at. So what's important is you can embed this into Excel documents. You, whenever you have SQL injection, you can use this. Whenever you have a payload, you can now use this. So anywhere that you have the ability, to, when you've compromised a system, to be able to run a command, you can execute this and it gives you a command prompt. And it doesn't touch disk. It doesn't you know, do anything. It doesn't make any modifications or historical data. The only way to detect this is if you were to be looking at memory forensics or memory analysis and looking from interpreter uh, directly in memory. So to show you what this kind of looks like, I'm just going to grab my IP address real quick. And so here's my IP. So I'm 192, 168, 134, 171. And if I run Unicorn, it's going to give you the syntax. And every cool hacker tool has to have uh, ASCII art. Um, so I put a unicorn in there. It's amazing. Oh, here's the rest of the unicorn here. There it is. OK, sorry. There's the unicorn. Um, it's a very big unicorn. So you run unicorn, and then what it asks for is the payload that you want to specify. So in this case, we're just going to use a, a Metasploit payload. And then um, the IP address, and, and so we need the IP address of where our attacker machine is at. If you're familiar with Metasploit, that's our L host. And then the port that it needs to communicate with us on, okay? And then what was added yesterday um, was an improvement onto the macro attack. So this will automatically generate macro code for you that you can embed this into a Word document and a PowerPoint and Excel document. And then literally as soon as they open it, and they obviously have to enable macros, but if you do a good pretext, it's not a problem. It's going to inject PowerShell um, into memory without touching disk. It's not going to do a download or anything like that. It's going to automatically compromise the machine and impact them. And it gets around antivirus and, and everything else out there. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and run this really quick. I'm just going to show you uh, two, two um, ways of doing it. Computers are hard. So I'm just going to run the, the first one. Now, what's interesting with this is that uh, it was funny. Uh, whenever I, I write tools, like sometimes I forget to tell my team, and I just publish it on the internet, and they don't pay attention. So I was uh, teaching at Black Hat last year, and I was showing this exact demo. And uh, they're like, and my whole team is helping me teach. They're like, when in the heck did you release this? We could have used this on like 40 different pen tests. I'm like, oh, I didn't, I didn't tell you guys. I'm sorry. I forgot. But normally, I, I, I tell everybody. Um, and then here it gives you the, um, the instructions on what you can do. But if you notice, it, it, it creates two files, okay? It creates a PowerShell underscore attacks at TXT. That's all of your code. 
And then it's going to use unicorn.rc, which is a what we call a resource file for Metasploit. Um, that's going to create our listener. So our listener is going to, you know, be sitting there waiting, saying, "Hey, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for a connection. Waiting for a connection." Then we execute the command on the Windows machine, and then it connects back to us, and then we have a connection back and forth to, to do our, our good stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and launch Metasploit real quick. In order to do that, you just type msf console space dash r and then unicorn.rc, and then I'm going to go ahead and open the the code up. Uh, now this is the command that you're going to run. Now that code on the right may look like, hey, it's like encrypted or whatever. It's uh, it's base64 encoded, and the reason we do that is, uh, I gave a talk at uh, like DefCon like 16 or 14, I think it was DefCon 14 or something. I don't remember. It was when PowerShell beta first came out. It wasn't in any operating system. No one had talked about it either from like a defensive or a security perspective. And I'm actually like one of the claim to fame of 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 my career is is being able to go up there and talk and about hacking PowerShell. I was the first one to ever go and do it with one of my uh, coworkers, Josh. So we went up on stage and we, at DEF CON and we talked about how you could hack PowerShell and do all this cool stuff and released a, uh, a way to um, uh, dump the SAM database through Power, uh, PowerShell. It was called PowerDump. I thought it was kind of funny. Um, but uh, we also did like reverse shells and things like that. Um, but it was a really cool way uh, to hack PowerShell. And one of the things that we identified is that um, when, when you use PowerShell, there's what's called software restriction policies. And there's restricted, unrestricted, all signed, and remote signed. Even in its most restrictive sense, if you have PowerShell locked down to its most uh, you know, potential capacity, you can still bypass all of those execution restriction policies regardless just by passing it the encoded command parameter, which is a built-in backdoor for Microsoft. So you know, basically, if you just pass this, and this code here has to be in a, in a Microsoft-specific format, which is just CAS Unicode and Base64 encoded. And then basically, if you copy and paste this into a command prompt anywhere you have remote command execution, it's going to inject into memory, connect back, and then you have access into the entire computer. So I'm going to go ahead and copy and paste this real quick. And if I just copy and paste it into the command prompt here, right? There's all my PowerShell code. I'm going to go ahead and make sure my listener's up real quick. You get this here, right? Hit enter. We'll get our shell back here in just a second. It takes a sec. Sometimes a little bit longer depending on how much I do it or if I messed up something, which I could have. It'll work, don't worry. It might not work. Let me just check what I did here. I might have something wrong. One seventy one. That's right. Well, it's supposed to work. It really does work. Anyways, it'll come up in a minute. Sometimes it takes a little longer. I might have uh, been messing around with it before. Um, but basically, you'd have a shell there that pops up. Now, there's a second method you can use, and I'll show you this one, and it'll work. I'm going to reboot this guy real quick. Actually, I guarantee I know what happened. I was testing it before. Yeah, I got like 400 shells open. That's why. I was testing it before, so I have like 30 different, uh, yeah, I should do it. Do that again. And And nothing. So, anyways, it's magic. The next one we can do, I'll show you, is, is the uh, macro attack. I'll get that to work. So instead of just specifying um, the port, the reverse handle in the port, you specify macro, and it'll copy and, and do all the macro encoding for you, and then basically uh, capture a macro. Now, why wouldn't that work? It's going to reboot. I just rebooted today, so I'm sure Windows needs another one. So now that this is generated here, if I leaf pad it again, you can see here, here's all the macro code. And all you need to do is embed that into a new macro, and then as soon as someone opens it and enables it, it compromises their machine. So let me show you an example of that real quick. If I just copy this, and I go into uh, to Office here, I'll go into Word as an example. Ch -ch -ch -ch. 
And um, if you're not familiar with using macros, uh, you have to enable them first. And this is for, for Mac, but I mean, you have to do the same thing in Windows as well. Um, basically, if you go into um, your preferences, so it's like file preferences or word preferences, if you go into uh, here and you go into ribbons, there's a um, developer tab down here that you have to add in one of, here, uh, one of these ones. Yeah. Where? Right there. There it is. Thank you. So that's already highlighted. And that gives you an additional tab um, to mess with macros inside of either Excel or Word. And so you notice up here I have a new developer tab. So I go to the developer tab and I hit macros. And I do auto open as my name. And I hit create. Get rid of all this code here. Paste all this new stuff here. Then you hit exit out of here. And we save our document. Now, in this case, when I save it, um, you want to make sure you save it as a macro-enabled document. So docm, save, and now you're good to go. You've just created your, your you know, fully malicious payload that as soon as they open it, compromises the machine, and that took like, what, 30 seconds or two minutes or something like that, right? Um, so it's ready to go. Um, and what's cool about this one is um, there was an individual that, that um, submitted this, uh, the macro pieces, which is awesome. Um, when he did that, one of the cool things he did, and I just uh, changed it around a little bit, is when they open up the, uh, the document they hit enable, a box is going to pop up, and the box title is going to say critical Microsoft Office error. And it's going to say, this document appears to be corrupt or missing critical rows in order to um, properly open. Uh, we're now going to close this application. Please use a recovery, uh, you know, recovery method of recovering it. And then it actually goes and closes the application. So they open it up, and it says, this file you know, pops up and says, this box is, this is corrupted. You hit OK, and it closes the whole application. So people don't usually see what actually occurred, and it actually compromises the machine. You get access to the system and uh, all that good stuff. A couple minutes to mess with. I'm going to try that, that again here, the unicorn stuff real quick, because I know it works. And I know I sacrificed like four chickens to the demo gods earlier, so... It... Try this again. So 192.168.134.171. 134. Ah, 172. My IP address changed when I was doing the presentation. I'm not supposed to do that. It wasn't me or my code. 172, it changed. Oh, is well, hang on. See? 172. See? When I did an IF config, it was 171. And when I did an IF config again, it was 172. Like literally, they changed it right in the middle of me. <laughs> That's so messed up. No, yeah, they want more chickens. A lot more chickens. What? No, the wine, the wine, and oh, the wine and chicken. It's gonna be. Yeah, we gotta fry the chicken. I didn't fry the chickens. No, it's that's actually a, an inside joke. Uh, when we were first starting ThurbyCon for the very first time, we decided to drive to to Louisville. You know, Aaron, my wife, and I just drove to Louisville, and we're all getting together to meet at this nice restaurant, you know, to, to meet, each, you know, talk over what we're going to be doing for DerbyCon, go see the place and everything, because we're trying to find a building to go to. And uh, Martin comes out and everything. I'm like, I call Asia. I'm like, hey, man, where are you at? He's like, ah, man. He's like, I'm just going to stay home. I got a box of fried chicken and a bottle of wine. I'm good. I'm like, all right, man. That's fine. Whatever flows your boat. Thanks for coming out, Adrian. Appreciate it, buddy. <laughs> Yeah, that was DerbyCon Zero, before it all started. All right, so once this loads, we'll go ahead and run it again if my IP address doesn't change. Go ahead and run it. Then, there it is. We get our shell. Yay. So then we get our shell again. Um, it's Ripper shell, so Metasploit based. Um, but anything that supports, uh, you know, if you have any type of assembly code that you want to inject into memory, you can use that. So it doesn't have to be uh, Metasploit or Meterpreter. Uh, it could be any assembly code that you want to. It's just take a look at the source and put the code in there. All of it's, you know, open source and everything. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I often use it on is, uh, to be familiar with uh, PSExec and Metasploit. Have you ever used that before? Uh, the problem with PSExec and Metasploit, and if you're not familiar with it, um, it's a way of either doing um, pass the hash or if you have normal credentials. You can pass the hash to the victims, and you can upload your own binary um, to the file system and then compromise it. The problem with that is that you have to either use your own custom binary, or if you use the one that's built into Metasploit, it's going to get snagged by antivirus. I don't know if you know this or not, um, inside of Metasploit 2, actually, if I were to use PSExec, go 
show the screen real quick. You actually have um, a directive that's uh, show advanced. To do show advanced, there's some, some additional settings you can do in there. And uh, one of the ones that I often use if I'm, if I'm going to use this and I want to use a, uh, a custom EXE is uh, you can do set space EXE colon colon custom and you give it the path to your, to your binary and it'll use a custom binary that you've already packed instead of the one that's built into Metasploit. Um, oftentimes those get picked up by AV and things like that so you can run your own custom one. But with this attack with, um, with PowerShell injection, um, you can actually use the um, psexec commands one, which is a very good module. And it's under auxiliary, so if you use auxiliary, admin, smb, psexec, command, you do show options on that. Um, you can actually do set command, and you just paste the PowerShell injection code there. And then what's also nice about psexec command is if you're familiar with psexec, you can only do one host at a time. It only supports our host. In this case, PSA command supports our hosts, which you can do entire CIDR notations. So you can just spray PowerShell throughout the whole network where you have credentials, and then you have just shells raining back. I've gotten hundreds and hundreds of shells from customers where you break in, and then all of a sudden I have a million shells thrown. And again, doesn't touch disk, doesn't trip anything. You know, it's a completely um, you know harmless uh, as far as you know um, traditional detection methods would would typically see. And what's nice about PSA command as well is it supports um, hash values. So for the SMV pass, you can just paste the LM and then the NTLM hash. And then boom, you know you have access to those. You don't have to crack the hashes or anything else that's out there. I use that all the time. And if you're familiar with uh, the Social Engineer Toolkit, um, this is actually all built into set already. Uh, I think I have set in here. Yeah, I'd hope so. So in, in the Social Engineer Toolkit, um, if you go to option number two, you can just do number six, and it'll do everything for you. It'll create the PowerShell injection code for you. It'll create your listeners for you automatically. Um, it'll um, ask you the ranges that you want to specify, and then it'll ask you for your username or password hash, and then it'll go ahead and spray the, the whole network for you automatically. So it uh, creates all the stuff for you, all the commands that you need to use, uh, and kind of does it automatically. So that was fun. So that's that's obviously on the um, the offensive side, right? So we're in the, the purple team theme. There's a new tool that one of our guys wrote, uh, uh, Jeffrey Walton, um, who... I uh, made a tool called Ships, and if you're not, has anybody seen Ships yet? Uh, if you haven't, it's pretty sweet. It's open source. This is for the blue team. And uh, what's funny about these acronyms is, like, you know, you might think like these acronyms are sophisticated, like when they come out with them. Well, Ships, uh, we ended up uh, uh, creating um, because one of the guys in the office, um, we had a, a chips bet at the Mexican restaurant to see how many bags of chips he could eat, and so he ended up getting nine. And so we're going to name the tool after him. We're going to call it Chips, but we couldn't find an acronym for C. Um, so we ended up calling it Ships because it sounded kind of piratey, and then we had to come up with an acronym for that. So that's how we kind of create all of our names at TrustedSec when it comes to our tools. Um, but here you can see uh, Ships is kind of a, a blue team uh, effort where uh, it's a really easy Ruby framework. And what happens uh, is a lot of times when you compromise an organization and you go after them, you know, what happens is, is you compromise one machine. Let's just say it's a, a user machine, right? You get privilege escalation, you get administrative on that machine, and then you, you grab the username and password hashes off of that system. And a lot of times that local administrator account is the same on that one system as it is in the rest of the organization, right? Or you got compromised one server, one member server, and the member server's administrator password is the same across all the rest of the, the servers themselves. Very easy lateral movement for us as attackers. So what we decided on, on the ship's front um, is to create more of an architecture that you could support that supports unique passwords per implementation of a workstation or server or Linux machine or, or uh, we support Cisco now. Um, so what you can do is, is you deploy a ship server, and it's a you know, Ruby uh, web server that runs, um, and it's you know, using cryptographically sound everything and all that good stuff, and it's open source, so you can take a look at it yourself. Um, but it runs a web server, and it supports uh, Active Directory integration. So let's just say I'm a, in a specific group that has access to workstation servers, right? I log in with my username and password. I can then do a search for a specific endpoint that I want to log into as administrator. And it has the unique password that gets created every day inside of there. Or you can have it every hour or 10 minutes or whatever you want to do. But what happens is, you know, it makes the passwords on every single machine completely unique. And it essentially manages them in this ship's infrastructure. So each endpoint, each server, everything has a completely unique um, local password. And it doesn't have to be the local admin. It can be any passwords um, that are kept on those machines or servers. Um, and what's, e what's interesting is that the endpoints, like, uh, what happens is it kicks off, you know, a script that 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 um, creates, you know, through through group policy or whatever, um, creates the the rotation of those passwords. But nothing's ever stored on here. It automatically communicates to the ship server. It generates a unique password again using, you know, cryptographically sound, you know, uh, PRNGs and everything in order to create all of that. 
and then it automatically um, deploys that new password to that individual system, and all of a sudden you have unique um, implementations across your entire environment. Uh, we have this deployed, you know, we've seen customers deploy this that have, you know, 20, 40, 50,000 endpoints. Um, so it's been deployed in a very large scalable environment already, uh, a number of scalable environments. Uh, banks have implemented this. Um, it's a really cool, you know, open source project uh, that's more on the blue team in trying to stop a lot of our pivoting and post-exploitation scenarios. It's kind of the look and feel. Um, we'll continue to get it, get it better as time goes on, but that's kind of what it looks like as far as like general, um, you know, look and feels and being able to look up um, specific fields. And so um, connectors can be written. Uh, there's a good documentation line on how you create a connector, but it all, it, all it is is an HTTP, uh, HTTPS request. So literally you just generate a quick script that anything that supports HTTPS, we have connectors already for Linux, for Unix, for Windows, for OS X. Um, and Cisco's already written, as we haven't published it yet. Uh, but anything that supports HTTPS calls, you can have the passwords be unique on those machines. So anything that has a scripting language of VB or PowerShell or you know, Bash or anything that can support HTTPS, you can create your own connectors for and have it automatically handle um, dealing with all of those. Back on the Red Team side, um, I recently released uh, um, Interpret over SSH. Uh, if anybody uh, has seen that, uh, a lot of times the uh, first stage of Metasploit uh, is fine. But the second stage ends up getting uh, snagged, especially like things like Palo Altos and, and things like that. Um, so I wrote a tool that um, it takes Metasploit shellcode, it shows it in the memory, and then it wraps it around an SSH tunnel and then tunnels SSH out of the company. Um, so it's an encrypted tunnel um, throughout the entire process. Um, that's open source. You can see that too. I won't spend a lot of time on that. Altillery, if you haven't seen that, um, it's an active honeypot. Again, more on the blue team side. Uh, this is one of the tools that I write um, that focuses on um, developing kind of a honeypot infrastructure that, you know, can detect attacks and then from there, um, you know, um, help out. It also does uh, file monitoring, um, all that good stuff um, on the operating system, looks for, you know, um, potential compromises on the systems, uh, things like that. You can see the ports running there. One of the most recent things that I added on the latest versions uh, was the, 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 originally when I created uh, Autillery, I deployed Autillery servers and honeypots um, kind of all across the globe. And I got them in some really weird places. Don't ask how I got there. It was kind of weird. But uh, um, I had to use like a burner credit card on a like Russian site and a bunch of stuff. But uh, but it worked. I have them on those VPSs now. Um, it's all legal, I think. But um, but I have these um, automatically feeding back. And you can actually download these feeds. It uh, cycles out every two weeks. So if you just go to binarydefense.com slash banlist.txt, these are known IP addresses um, that um, have, you know, that are attackers. So you get known, you know, feeds of, of different attackers. Um, since they're deployed in customers, we get those feeds as well. So we get kind of real-time um, analysis. And anytime that we're doing like an instant response, we automatically update um, the ban list as well. But also, most recently, I had um, additional feeds that I pull into there. Um, so like um, command and control blocks, um, you know, bad IP addresses that have been identified by Pill, uh, Votracker, um, a lot of the other ones like Malcode, IP blacklists. It takes all of those aggregates and back into that ban list as well, so you get a pretty good feed um, of all of those different um, active IP addresses that are out there, and that's um, from the most recent uh, version. Working on it. <laughs> uh, what I'm releasing next in the next couple of weeks, I'm actually finished with it. I've just, I haven't had time to like clean up the code. It's like really ugly, and that usually never stops me from releasing anything, so I don't know why it is now, but um, the Pentestus framework um, is to keep it kind of, uh, put into perspective. Does anybody here use Kali Linux or, you know, yep, everybody, right? Um, Kali's phenomenal. I use it all the time. It's, it's a great tool. Um, but there's also things that, that aren't necessarily updated as fast as I would like. Um, like, for example, a lot of the tools themselves, especially ones like Metasploit or Set or especially like, you know, tools that I, I continuously update on a regular basis. We also have internal tools um, that we use that I need repositories for to automatically keep up to date. Like Larry, one of our guys, may update one of his code bases and I don't remember to update it and then I forget about it or whatever. So I, I created this thing called the Pentesters Framework. And it's a, it's a Metasploit feel um, type framework that allows pen testers to create their own real, kind of their own tool sets and own distributions uh, for their teams and then share that so that you can continuously keep all of your stuff up to date. Um, and so, like, for example, um, you know, when you go into it, you can add your own modules and you don't have to be a programmer to figure out your own modules. You literally just create your own, um, I'll show you in a second, but literally it takes about 30 seconds to five minutes maybe to, to create your own module to, to create it. Then you have your own tools in there, your own repos or your own um, you know, infrastructure, your own tools that you go pull off from the rest of the world and it automatically keeps all of your stuff up to date real time. And I'll show you an example of this. So 
it's of course in Python, as is anything I write. Um, we run, uh, and again, anything's got to have ASCII art, right? And then, so you get into PTF, and it automatically detects what platform you're on. So if you're running Debian or Ubuntu or Red Hat or whatever you end up running, it's going to detect that platform and automatically associate that with you know RPMs or whatever you're doing for um, specific package management. Or if you're not using it at all, it'll um, install it uh, separately. But if I just go to, to type, you know, type question mark or help, it'll tell you some of the options. But if you do show option or show modules, you can see here are some that I've already written. Um, but these are the tools that are out there that I want to keep up to date. Now, does anybody, anybody ever start pen testing with Backtrack or, or Wapix or any of those other ones, right? So I remember, I remember, remember the slash pen test directory. I mean, miss the pen test directory, right? Because you know you can go to a pen test directory and you'd be like, okay, here's all the tools that I would use for enumeration, or here's all the tools I use for exploitation. Well, they they switch that around to what's called FSH compliance, which is all of your tools now are, are the launchers are in user bin and the data is actually in user share. So you no longer have those directories. So you have to kind of you know weave through the menu structures and everything. So what I did is I I, I created um, recreated that pen test directory again, and I kept in line with the the penetration testing execution standard as a methodology for where it installs from. But it'll install these things in different directories. Like it'll install it under slash pen test slash intelligence gathering slash dictionary. You know, slash pen test, slash intelligence gathering, slash recon ng. But here's all the tools that I built in uh, for modules already. And what what this will do is every time that you run it, if it's not there, it'll install it the first time. And you run it again, if it's not there, it'll automatically update all these tools for you real time. So you have all the latest and greatest tools um, up to date, you know, real time. And just to show you how easy the modules are, I wrote it in e really easy programming language behind it. So notice here that everything's broken down into different categories. So we have, you know, exploitation, intelligence gathering, post-exploitation. You could just add a new directory if you want to create your own, like Dave's cool stuff, and make a directory. It'll automatically pick that up, and then it'll grab all of the modules inside of there. So it's all dynamic. It automatically imports in real time. And then let's just say I go to exploitation. I'll show you how easy a module is. So here's a couple of, of modules here, right? You have beef, metasploit, readynum, um, set, responder. So if I go to responder, just open up responder. It requires an author, okay, of who wrote the module. The description of the, the, the tool. What type of installation is going to be? Is it going to be Git, SVN, um, or straight file download? It'll support file downloads. You can download the files and I'm going to grab it. The repository location, install location, and then, you know, the, uh, Debian. And then I created something called after commands, um, which is like, you know, sometimes, you know, when you download a file, it's not just a script. It's an actual application that you have to run, you know, configure, make, and all that stuff. After commands are something that you can run after you've downloaded the file. And it'll automatically um, do those commands afterwards so you can do installs and things like that. So you can literally create, does that seem like an easy way to create a module? Like if you know the download path and location, literally just copy this and paste it in and then you're all set. It takes about 30 seconds to a few minutes to, to actually create it. So you can create your own own modules, your own um, you know uh, tools and keep them up to date real time. And then just to kind of show you how easy it is, so if I do, you know, here let me make sure my, my pen test directory is you know, clear. I always check like four times when I do an rm dash rf star. So I make sure I'm in the right directory when I do that. Um, so if I use modules, you can do install all or update all, which would do both. But um, if I do like modules, I'll do an easy one. Let's just do uh, unicorn. Tab complete is kind of working. I need to fix that's one thing I need to fix before I get done. Uh, but I'll do unicorn. So if I use this module and I do show options, you can see here it automatically pulls the locations that you made for that specific framework. And then when I want to go and use it, I just hit run. It's going to go automatically go and clone it. And then boom, it's done. Now if I go under a pen test directory, it's going to be under post-exploitation. And here's my tool. Now let's just say I want to keep it up to date. I just hit run again. See, it automatically notices that I already had it installed. It goes in and automatically updates it. But you know, you don't want to do this for each individual tool, right? Because that kind of defeats the purpose. So if I do show options, show modules, sorry. If I do use modules install all, it'll go through and it'll cycle through and make sure that all the tools that you currently have installed are either in A installed or B updated. So again, it's an easy way to kind of essentially manage all the tools that you would typically use as a pen tester um, and make sure that they're all there and kind of manage them. Okay. Again, that should be out in a couple weeks. Probably a week. I got an airplane ride with Martin here, and so I'll probably code it on the airplane. And then lastly, you know, set, um, obviously a cool tool. Um, I'm almost done with version 6.3.1. There was a, the last version 6.3, I rehauled a large portion of the code. Like I um, got rid of like probably around 2,000 lines of old code and rewrote it um, because it was just old code and I needed to rewrite it. Um, 
but um, I optimized it. So when I got rid of 3,000, I added like only like 150 lines, so that's a good day. Um, but I also created a lot of uh, different methods for the payload delivery systems. Uh, for example, um, it does smart selection now where um, if you compromise through the Java applet, it will detect the most reliable exploitation technique um, on the actual operating system and then drop it there. And then it won't drop any other methods unless it detects that it was successful. So like for example, if it does PowerShell exploitation, it will compromise that and then it won't drop binaries on top of that um, and, and leave remnants. I'm working on a new HTA injection technique through Internet Explorer, uh, a few other ones, and then I had to fix a bunch of bugs that I introduced with a new one, my new code, obviously. I introduced new bugs, um, so I had to fix a lot of those. Talked about Unicorn already. We're already past that. If you're not familiar, uh, there's a good blog post that one of our guys, Larry, just did, um, and he wrote some code for it too, which is um, when you compromise an um, organization, right, the, the biggest thing that we look for is, is privileged accounts or uh, people that are administrators in their machines. Because usually a lot of times if you go to the administrator's machine, either A, they may have a Kerberos token that we can impersonate, or B, they might have credentials on that system that we can use in order to do it. Um, what Larry wrote was a, an automated way um, to sweep the whole network, looking for privileged tokens, both Kerberos tokens and ClearText passwords. Um, if you're familiar, familiar with Mimikatz, uses an undocumented feature with an LSAS uh, to query uh, something called WDigest, which extracts a ClearText password from memory. Um, it does all of that for you and sweeps the whole network and then gives you a, basically a text file of all of the creds and the privileges that they have, and then it'll hunt for specific tokens that may be elevated and, and give you those tokens so that you can use those tokens um, to elevate your permissions in an environment for lateral movement. So this is Password Hunter. Let's just go through and uh, uh, grab your passwords. Um, there's also Token Hunter as well. Uh, there's a blog post at the bottom there. If you just Google um, you know, Password Hunter and Trusted Sec, you'll find it. Uh, it's a recent blog post that we did in, in January, but uh, it walks you through the whole steps of, of what you need to do. So that was... Uh, that was a lot of, lot of you know, offense and defensive type stuff. You know, what's interesting with a lot of those attacks that we do, I mean, the, the techniques I get access into an environment isn't sophisticated, right? If I, if I compromise one machine, and that one machine can only communicate on like 18443 to the data center and to not to any other people next to them, like new workstations, is it very hard for me to pivot and export the rest of the environment? Yes, right? So network segmentation alone makes it much more difficult for me as an attacker to compromise the rest of an organization. Um, doing things like removing administrative level rights from users. You know, privilege escalation is a very challenging one um, if you're fully patched and up to date. And it takes a little while for me to get through. And again, we're not trying to make it impervious, but we're trying to make it a lot harder. Did you know you can disallow PowerShell from regular users? PowerShell is probably one of the most used methods right now. If you have server 2008 or above, you have something called AppLocker. App lock, well, you also have software restriction policies too, but app locker is basically application whitelisting built into Windows for you. You can specify, hey, disallow PowerShell for normal users. So if a normal user goes around PowerShell, it doesn't work. Does a normal user ever need to use PowerShell? No, right? So that's one thing we should be stopping right now is disallowing PowerShell from just our regular user population. You can also do uh, like 90% of most malware infections use the temp directory to drop malware into. Just literally, like, you know, if I'm downloading something from, from IE or I'm getting export in IE, the download or the stager gets dropped into the temp directory and then it gets executed from there. With AppLocker, you disallow executables in the temp directories. Now, granted, there's a couple of crummy applications that still use that, like Java, for example, so you have to whitelist those. Um, but aside from those, I mean, you know, literally, you disallow those, you stop 90% of your malware infections, and you stop PowerShell injection, which is the, one of the most prominent uh, infection vector, uh, vectors that you see out there. So those are two things that you can do right now that literally hinder a lot of the stuff that we would traditionally see out there. By the way, those two things alone, would stop set. It's not going to stop my, well, actually, it would stop, it would stop that, that uh, um, uh, macro injection, too, just by doing those three things, two things. Oh. If you don't need to shut it down, right? Basic principles. Minimize your damage, like data center segmentation. Does a normal user ever need to communicate on Oracle ports or, or Microsoft SQL ports or anything like that? No, right? So why do we have that open to our Salesforce? Why can our Salesforce communicate on Microsoft SQL? So when I compromise one box, that SA password that you forgot to change has direct access to it from the sales machine. Doesn't make any sense, right? Minimization of ports and protocols. Easy stuff. Now here's one thing that we got to be careful of. Remember I talked about like APTs and, and you know hackers breaking in and using all the sophistication? There's a few folks in this industry right now, in, in the security industry, that are prominent people um, that are talking about adversarial simulation as a method for trying to um, understand how attackers work. And that's fine and dandy if your program is at a point to handle adversarial simulation. And when I talk about adversarial simulation, it's basically trying to um, uh, mimic an advanced uh, attacker, an advanced persistent threat, right? 
Well, what people fail to realize is that advanced persistent threats, like most of them, like 99% of the groups are terrible at hacking. They're absolutely horrible. They're using basic stuff. They're using the same stuff that we use on a regular basis. There's nothing advanced about them. Now, granted, every little group has their, their awesome rock stars, right, that have IE zero days and are burning through Windows zero days and things like that. The very small group that's targeting government contractors and things like that for intelligence purposes, they're not burning O days on Fortune 1000 companies. They're just not doing it unless it's, you know, uh, military or, or government related. So these advanced uh, very, uh, simulations are actually doing a lot of harm. Like uh, one of the biggest ones that, that you'll hear of is like, hey, you need to simulate the, the Kerberos golden ticket because that's going to be what an advanced actor is going to do. And listen, man, you still have password one as most of your, pa for 30% of your population of your user accounts. The last thing you need to be worrying about is golden tickets. Trust me, you got nothing to worry about. You need to worry about your password ones first, all right? Or that MS-867 that's still on your environment that you haven't segmented off or you can't get out of your thing. Or the 2003 servers that you haven't patched in two years because the business won't let you. Those are the things that you need to focus on, not the golden ticket, right? So you need to be careful of what type of level of assessment that you get. You don't need to simulate advanced threat actors burning zero days in your environments because that one tool that you just bought, you need to show value on, right? Because you just bought a FireEye, so you need to make sure that FireEye is actually protecting against APTs when, you know, the, the password for the FireEye server is password one. Right? So those are the things that we need to focus on instead of focusing on these advanced things that are out there. Also starting with the youth. Um, there's a major pandemic right now around uh, 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 the youth uh, when it comes to bringing into the industry. What, what happened is that the security industry grew so, so fast that people that had a lot of um, experience, you know, accelerated very quickly. And it created this gap in the middle where there's people with no experience, right? And then you have people with, you know, no experience and then people with a lot of experience. And so there's this gap right now where companies are like, hey, I need somebody with experience and I want to hire them, but there's no one to fill those shoes. And so they don't want to make the investment on new folks coming into the industry. They want to focus on the people that know stuff that's doing in the industry. So there's this gap in between right now um, that we really have to fill. And, it, you know, it's interesting because, you know, a lot of schools need to focus on teaching relevant topics around security, um, around, you know, whatever, it, if it's penetration testing or exploit research or, you know, incident response, you know, those topics need to be relevant and up to date uh, with what's actually happening out there or else we're not going to ever fill that gap out there. Um, there's an uh, individual um, named Mano Paul. His, his son is Ruben. Who's a guy, he's a nine-year-old. And uh, we had Ruben over at DerbyCon. And, you know, Ruben, I'm sitting there and, you know, I was going to go, I just went to the class, you know, to, to support Mano because he's a nice guy and everything. And I sit, and sit down and I'm, you know, I hadn't experienced, you know, this nine-year-old before. And he gets on stage, you know, because we gave him a, a spot at DerbyCon. And he gets up on there and he's using set and he's hacking into a computer system, a fully patched Windows 8, and he's breaking into things. He's got shells and everything. I'm like, whoa, that's awesome, right? And so uh, Ruben just keynoted at RSA, like, you know, like, or was one of the big, you know, talks at RSA when he's hacking into computer systems. So, you know, we got to teach our youth the right way of going through things and doing things. Because that's the most important one uh, that's really, really happening out there. And that's really all I got. Anybody have any questions? Is brain hurt? Talk, talk fast. I had two cups of coffee, so that's that's bad for me. <laughs> Testing framework. Yep. Yep. Actually, uh, yeah, I know. I um, I got around to riding it on an air, airplane ride one time, so it worked out. It's funny. Well, what's funny is like uh, whenever I, I I code projects. Like, I'll get, like, 70, 80% done with a project, and then I totally forget about it, and then I, I don't touch it for, like, two years. And then I'm like, oh, I had some cool code here. I should probably finish this up. And so, like, interpreter over SSH, I had written, like, three years ago and totally forgot about it. And then, like, I'm like, oh, I need to sign a pen test. Wait, didn't I write something about that? And I, then I'm grepping through my folder, like, looking for all my code. And I'm like, oh, this would be cool to actually publish the, the community. So then I publish it and I forget about it. So I actually have a folder. I mean, it's no joke. See this folder right here? This is all my, li oh, you guys can see it, hang on. <laughs> it's that secretive. <laughs> see this folder right here? This is all the cool stuff that I really want to release, but it would literally like blow up the internet type stuff. So I don't release it yet because the, the, the internet can't handle it. So like one of the things that I wrote is a way to do Materpret over SSH over HTTPS and it's proxy aware. So like literally you can tunnel, you know, Materpret traffic over SSH over HTTPS out of the network and it's fully encrypted, right? But that would blow up the internet. So you know, I don't want to release that because it's going to blow up the internet. So there's a lot of stuff in this stuff folder that I, is like really cool, but I just can't use it for probably another like three or four or five years. So that's why I forget about it. I'm like, well, I'm a server over SSH. I, yeah, I guess I can publish it. Now it's not going to blow up the internet too much. So 
Um, you know, there's zero days and stuff in there that I've been messing with. Um, you know, they still haven't been patched. <laughs> Believe me, this, this this virtual machine is encrypted twice, um, and it doesn't leave it doesn't leave my site. So, um, but uh, you know, those are the types of things that you know we're not at a, at a capacity yet as an industry uh, to really be able to handle. So, why you know do the industry harm when when you know there's things that you can do? But you know, someday I'll be able to release it and it's gonna be really cool. And I'll be like, oh hey, I forgot I coded that four years ago, and finally the you know we don't have MS Windows six seven on our servers anymore, so I can use this one now. Um, but uh, we'll see. Probably not gonna happen. Any other questions? All right. Well, thanks for having me. Appreciate it.